Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, I'm delighted that uh, today my guest is one of our most prominent uh, academics. Matthew Goodwin is Professor of Politics at the University of Kent. He's also the author of a number of very influential and award-winning books. First of all, Revolt on the Right, which won the Orwell Prize, and more recently, National Populism, The Revolt Against Liberal Democracy, which we have a copy of here. Uh, he's joining me now from Kent. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I, I wanted to sort of start by asking you, but recently uh, you were giving evidence to a Commons committee on uh, education. Can you explain what that was about, why you were there? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, firstly, it's great to uh, finally be um, connecting on, on this. I know we've been planning it for a while. Uh, the Education uh, Select Committee was really um, um, focusing on an inquiry that had been put together by Robert Halfen, the Conservative MP, on left behind uh, white pupils. Uh, and I think that was really grounded in the uh, observation that uh, on almost every measure of education uh, that we have, uh, looking at the outcome of uh, uh, children at age five, um, uh, GCSE uh, and then progression uh, through A-level and on to, to higher education, uh, white British boys and girls on free school meals, which we use as a, a proxy for disadvantage, uh, are actually uh, among the worst performing uh, group uh, in the country. In fact, the only group that tends to perform worse uh, on many of those measures are children from Gypsy, Roma uh, and Irish traveller families. So. Uh, Robert Halfen has obviously uh, been campaigning on this for a while. We've actually had reports on this for 10 years, 10 years or more. Uh, and the inquiry is really focused on bringing lots of people together from different perspectives, I think, to try and look at actually what we can do uh, about it. And so you, you were saying that basically, as I understand it, that this doctrine that we hear a lot about at the moment called white privilege uh, is actually... Mask, not just masking a situation, but perhaps making it worse. Is that right? Well, what happened during the evidence session, which I found quite remarkable, is that while we were talking about the socioeconomic barriers that uh, these children are facing, I was actually asked to reflect on white privilege by a Labour MP during the session. I would point out that I didn't voluntarily um, yeah raise that point but I, I was asked to reflect on on that by a Labour MP and um, I was actually quite stunned by that given that the evidence really <laughs> suggests that there are lots of important things going on but but the narrative of white privilege really is not a causal uh, factor for this this problem but it did lead me to suggest that perhaps the broader conversation that we're having about race relations in the country about racism, about the legacy of empire, about all of these interpretations of, of the country and its history that have become much more prominent um, since the protests, uh, that this is unhelpful in trying to think through this particular problem because I would argue we know that white British uh, people, in particular from working class backgrounds, um, already uh, face what I would call a status deficit in that they are generally not treated with the same degree of esteem, recognition and respect as other groups within British society. And I'm not the first person to make that point, Peter, as, I, as I'm sure you know that people like Peter Hall at Harvard, David Goodhart, the writer, um, more recently Michael, Sand Michael Sandel, um, you know, various other academics have talked about this issue of status loss and status deficit. And, and I think white privilege fits in there because even though it's a fairly new um, uh, narrative, I think it taps into this deeper unease among many uh, people that they are being asked to feel bad about themselves and, and being asked to um, perhaps not have that sense of agency that, that they might otherwise have and that these issues that are often about economic um, barriers are, are now suddenly sort of transformed into a discussion around race. 
uh, which I don't think is particularly helpful, as I made clear, and I was glad to see some other uh, politicians and, and political figures continue that conversation, actually, throughout the events of that week, because I think that debate is long overdue. But, you know, even if you're if, if you're just making a nuanced point or if you're if you're suggesting or you're just adding to a, adding to a discussion, as you were indeed. Um, are there problems now for academics such as yourself, even just simply discussing these things? I mean, the the the, the impression one gets increasingly is and we've spoken to quite a few academics on the program recently, is that essentially, you know, they're very much now in a kind of, uh, if you like, mental prison, or rather they're kept in a mental prison, that even to discuss things is somehow, if they don't go with the orthodoxy, is somehow problematic, to use their phrase. Do you, is that over-egging the whole pudding, do you think, to say that or not? I think there's an entirely legitimate debate to be had about challenges to academic freedom within higher education, and those are by no means restricted to Britain. But this is, this is I think, a debate that is also taking place in, in uh, the United States uh, and, and, to a lesser extent, Canada. And I think what we've seen here, in particular since the election in 2019, is that debate begin to bleed into politics. We saw the Conservative Party become... Uh, probably the first political party in Europe to include a commitment to academic freedom in its manifesto. And I'm sure um, your, uh, your followers and your subscribers are already aware of some of the interventions that uh, UK academics have made in this area, Nigel Bigger being uh, one such voice. Uh, and we've had the Times and, and other newspapers, you know, also, I think, thankfully, try and raise this debate. I think it's true that uh, given the ideological orientation of the majority of academics, which we know from surveys and other work, uh, understanding society, Chris Hanretti, Eric Kaufman and others have already, I think, shown the way in which the academic community leans in a particular direction. And I think we also know in through publicised cases that we've had, Jordan Peterson at Cambridge, Noah Carl, Selena Todd, I could go on, um, cases that have been documented by the Free Speech Union, that we do have an issue. I think the debate is very much around what is the scale of that issue, and, and secondly, what do we do about it? Uh, and I think what's been great to see over the last six months from my perspective as somebody who publicly said you know to give brexit as an example i, I publicly said i you know i think the, the vote for brexit was a entirely legitimate and understandable response um and should be respected uh that i think you know even even that sort of puts you in around the sort of 10 percent community within academia that's simply saying that you sort of accept the the vote and you you know you you essentially support the outcome um, and that gives you a sense of the scale so over the last six months I've been I've been heartened by the degree to which uh, people within government and around government have been willing to at least have a conversation about okay well what would we do here to try and ensure that the the thing that has made our universities some of the best universities in the world academic freedom the freedom to explore and inquire and, and study questions from different perspectives without social norms, without the fear of sanction, without the fear of so-called chilling effects, whereby colleagues will gradually distance themselves from those who are seen to be violating social norms. Um, you know, we need to really think about ways that we can ensure that continues. And you know, there are people, Peter, that you will have seen on social media who say, well, you know, this is not an issue. I think the number of cases that we've had within the university sector, the sort of disinvitations, you know, Amber Rudd and many other such cases, you know, do point to there being an issue. And also we've seen over the last couple of weeks, even organisations like the UCU, uh, the main trade union for higher education, bring motions which suggest that they should be pushing back on academic freedom, particularly when it is seen to violate issues around uh, LGBT and, and diversity issues. Now, 
I hope that many of my academic colleagues would argue that academic freedom is is non-negotiable. It it is the one thing that 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 ensures that we can um, pursue truth and we can study and explore freely. And I think the evidence is clear that we do need to have a debate about whether academic freedom is now being challenged and what we can do to uphold it. Uh, I just want to take up that point you made there about the is the U UCU uh, and uh, w what they were saying there. Uh, you you uh, uh, sorry, you're describing how they feel that certain speech should actually be as it were, limited in relation to certain groups. Is that right? Yeah, I use that as an example that there's yeah. a motion that's being brought to their conference, which states that academic freedom arguments are being used to curtail action around, oh. I use in quotations, diversity issues. And we've seen how that has been applied to academics like uh, Selena Todd, um, and others who have who have seen to violate in the eyes of these communities or activists who have been seen to violate sacred values and social norms. And I think where we need to try and get to as a community, as a country, is to really uh, explore how we can ensure that academic freedom cannot be curtailed, that, that we do need people who are free to explore questions on uh, diversity, uh, immigration, you know, all of those sort of controversial, sensitive questions, um, uh, you know, and, and, and be free to do that in a way where they, whereby they do not face social uh, and career um, uh, consequences for doing so. And, and that is what we're seeing, uh, unfortunately. And I'm fully sympathetic on one level to people who say, well, you know, this might not be a sort of as dominant a, an issue as some suggest, but but I really push back against the view that this is not an issue. And some people are trying to argue that this is not an issue. And I, I simply don't think the data backs that up now. I think we clearly have an issue within higher education and we need to collectively have a debate about what we can do to make it a better environment. Uh, obviously that's the academic world, but there is a general uh, sense in the air at the moment of a kind of culture war. Uh, if, if you want to put it that way. Um, I wondered really, Matthew, you've started, you know, the rise of what is called populism uh, in Europe, indeed, and in this country, and I, I guess as well in, in America. And I, I just wonder whether you see that populism as being a response to uh, what we've just been discussing, I, a sort of sense in which people are being as it were, trammeled into what they can and cannot say. I mean, you know, it, it's obviously not the whole reason behind it, but do you see that as being one of the reasons why populism, as you have written about it, uh, seems to have really sort of taken hold over the past five years or so? I think there's a consensus now among people who have written on the topic, who have, who have studied it, that, that we are seeing a reaction to what you might call liberal overreach that you know the the liberal drift that sort of began in the post-war years and carried through achieved some really important things but also in some cases went too far in alienating um particular groups within our society, whether that relates to the pace and scale of things like migration, whether it relates to arguments around freedom of speech and curtailing the ability of people to contribute to the marketplace of ideas in a free uh, way, uh, or whether it relates to you know, our current debates over things like uh, you know, media, the BBC, and what people see as being the undermining of their their national symbols and, and myths and, and nationhood. Uh, and I think, you know, whether that's reflected in the work that we've seen by uh, colleagues in America who have, who have talked about this as being a sort of cultural backlash, a backlash against the excesses of, of social liberalism, uh, or whether we've seen it, you know, for example, in some of the work that, that we did on the UK, where we, we talked about the value divides that have really underpinned our society. And then after, 
you know, UKIP and things like that then found their expression not only through Brexit, but also through Boris Johnson's victory last year, I think, and his realignment of British politics, that I think inevitably these things are part of that broader pushback, that there is a sense among a not insignificant number of voters that you know they do feel that the uh, their conception of the national community, their, their view of the national community, its symbols, its institutions, the ability to speak freely, to interpret British history in a particular way, that all of those are being undermined by these new narratives. And of course, we could talk all day about this, um, you know, and, and the sort of intellectual currents behind it. But but I do think that these issues uh, play play directly into that. I'm slightly wary of saying that this is now an inevitable um, culture war. I think the British have always been uh, known for you know, their civic culture for always stressing moderation, compromise, consensus. And I think what worries me at the moment is as we polarise, um, that, that civic culture feels further and further away. Uh, and we need to somehow find a way of returning to that, but, but also in a way that, that um, brings compromise. And, and that means compromises on both sides. It means that on one hand, social liberals might need to say, yes, we went too far on some things. Yes, globalization didn't work out as well as we hoped for everybody. Immigration didn't work out as well as we hoped for everybody. Not everybody does share our very thin civic sense of national identity. Uh, maybe we should ensure that things like academic freedom are, are, are upheld. Maybe we should push back against the pulling down of statues without any democratic accountability. And those are kind of points within this conflict where I think a compromise could be made. Uh, you know, and on the other side, there are compromises too that, you know, uh, people, I think, who, who, who might be on the more populist or socially conservative wing too will have to accept that you know, the country has changed in many ways that might make them feel uncomfortable, but in many ways have also strengthened Britain. Um, and it's how we get to that point now, I think, is is the primary challenge facing the country, uh, how we get to that point of compromise and whether, of course, people are willing to compromise. I was going to say, what do you think? What do you think the chances of of it are? Well, I think as we come out of Brexit, you know, we, Britain is in a different position from many other democracies, in that we've just gone through a rebellion that has fundamentally and permanently altered the direction of the country. Now, whatever your views about Brexit, there's no going back to the status quo pre-spring 2016. So that makes us somewhat different from the French and the Germans and the Italians and perhaps even the Americans because, you know, they can vote Donald Trump out if they want. And I know we'll come on to that in a second. But I think with us, we've sort of crossed this watershed. And one of the reasons why I was quite quick to say, you know, I think this is a decision that should be upheld and implemented is because it inevitably now forces us to get into that compromise and to say, OK, what kind of society are we going to build? Because clearly we all know what we need to do. We need to make that society less dependent upon London, the South East and financial services. We need to level up the regions that have suffered from a lack of inward investment for 50 years. We need to reform the migration system uh, and think about ways of of um, supporting and boosting the integration of our communities while we have the opportunity to do so. And we want to finally transform our relationships, not just with the European Union, but with other states around the world and think about how we can change the underlying economic model in this country so it isn't just focused on consumption. You know, and I think if we if we embrace that opportunity and we had all of the intellectual firepower that came with both social conservatives and social liberals and actually put that to use and said, what is the new settlement rather than just constantly trying to uh, attack the other side, you know, I think then we can strike this great compromise. Now, I'm sure many people watching this will say that is incredibly naive, but it strikes me as you know, that is one option. The other is we simply stay on this road toward America style polarization and everything becomes a proxy of the culture war, you know, the pulling down of statues, the teaching of history, how we respond to things like uh, white working class kids falling through the cracks, the emerging discussions around 
toxic masculinity, white privilege and so forth, which to me don't really seem like they're very well equipped to bring people together. They just seem as though they're hardwired to, to push us toward racialized identities uh, that are ultimately, I think, quite divisive and not unifying. Uh, and that's the challenge that I think we're faced with. It's an interesting point you made there, actually, about Brexit being, you know, a very fundamental way in which the country decided to change direction. Uh, and what is different about Brexit compared to, say, other results of populism, for example, Trump or, or in Europe, uh, is that it was a thing, wasn't it? It was a, a subject. It wasn't a person. It was actually something quite fundamental to the country. And I, I wonder, when you, look at a, when you look at America now, uh, you, you did refer to it then. Do you think that there is a very strong possibility, because this is going out uh, on, the fri on Friday before the elections uh, in America, do you think there is a chance that America will actually decide we've had enough of this disruptor, uh, we want to go back to the status quo? Well, I think oh, it's entirely think possible. Uh, as, we, as we sit here today and you look at the, the polls, um, Joe Biden's averaging an eight-point lead nationally, four points in the battlegrounds. It's still entirely plausible for Trump to win. Um, he's basically where he was um, at this point in 2016 in, in the key battlegrounds. He's a little bit weaker nationally, but, but you know, he's still, he's still got a chance. I think Biden, obviously, it's his race to lose at the moment. Um, and the outcome will, will tell us a great deal. I think beyond who moves into the White House, I think the outcome of the election will tell us um, about the, uh, the reply to the Trump moment, to the, the rise of Trumpism. It will tell us uh, how much enthusiasm uh, his coalition uh, of voters still has. I think it will, however, also have huge implications on the wider world. I, in some sense, I push back against your question, Peter, because I don't think Biden is a return to the status quo in the sense that if you look at many of his policies on economics, he's actually gone much further toward Trump than Obama ever did. You know, he's got the made in America tax credits. He's got the offshore penalty. He's got the um, the review, not the removal of the tariffs on China. So on a lot of those policy positions, the more economic protectionist positions, I actually think the Democrats have moved a little bit closer to Trump. Uh, and I think they've done that to try and close down their their flank. But of course, that leaves the, the culture flank completely open. You know, the, the migration issue, uh, the terrorism uh, issue, the building the wall uh, issue. And I think if Trump ends up winning, it's a sign that that cultural insecurity is still dominant, is still a very potent driver in politics. If he ends up losing and Biden wins, then it might be that, well, coronavirus, the economic crisis, push those concerns further down the list and and and, and put Biden over the edge. But I, I do think that even in that case, we're going to see... Uh, you know, let's imagine that the polls are right and Biden wins for a second. I think we're going to have a fascinating debate within, within the Republican Party about what is the future of conservatism in the United States. Is it a Tucker Carlson, Marco Rubio, let's stay left on the economy, right on culture? Or is it a Nikki Haley, Mitt Romney, let's go back to mainstream, good old Republicanism and be fiscally conservative and still quite liberal on those social questions? Uh, and I think that will have international consequences uh, too. But either, either way, the polarization that we're witnessing in the US, as I'm sure everybody who, who watches this will agree, you know, the underlying divides in American society aren't going anywhere, no matter who wins uh, the election. I think America is going to remain deeply, deeply polarized uh, for some time to come. Uh, and it's difficult to see a way forward for the United States at the moment uh, given how um, intense those levels of polarization really are. Uh, and we're not, we're not at that point yet, but we are on the same road, but a few mm. miles behind. Are you surprised, actually, Matthew, with the, the depth of that polarization and also, for that matter, the speed with which things have happened in America this year? I mean, I'm surprised by it. I, I would have 
imagined it happening more in Europe than in America, but it it just seems to have been so intense. I, I just wondered, I know probably you don't like speculating, but you mentioned there we should take for granted maybe uh, when we were talking about a Biden victory, certain circumstances, if we therefore take for granted that Trump were to win um, next week, what do you feel might happen? I mean, do you, do you think there could be serious sort of social convulsion as a result? Well, I think if we end up seeing a, you know, if theoretically we saw a Trump win, I imagine we would see much of what we saw in 2016, but a little bit more intense. We would see protests and demonstrations, and I'm sure some of the things that we've seen in places like Portland would probably continue. I think on the other hand, if Biden wins, there's now an open question mark about how diehard Republicans respond to that. And I think what worries me about America is that the stakes are so high now for both sides that this isn't simply a, about policy anymore. This isn't simply about competence anymore. It, it isn't simply about economic strategy anymore. I think for both sides, the election outcome really hinges on a much more fundamental question, namely, who are we and what kind of country are we? And for those on the losing side, whether Democrat or Republican, I think inevitably there is that sense that they are losing their country because this polarization has reached such a point whereby election outcomes are almost existential. Uh, and, and it relates to, you know, their destiny as a nation and also relates to how they see their birth as a nation, as we've seen through the 16. 19 project and, and things like that, that for one side of America, they feel as though their country is being rewritten, their national story is being rewritten. And I think that also taps into the debates that we've seen in Europe, that as I what I would call identity liberalism has come unstuck and sort of taken, if you like, a left turn from the founding principles of, of lib liberalism, I think it has really moved further down this line of reconstruction of trying to reconstruct national identities and histories and uh, myths and symbols and that has found its expression through things that we've seen around uh, last night of the proms around statues the cenotaph Winston Churchill but in America obviously it's taken on much even more potent um, uh, uh, expressions and and I think that is something that we really didn't see previously, uh, when many of our political debates were organized around the economy, public services and the state, and the left right divide was the dominant divide in politics, whereas now, I think we've all we can all sense that actually that is now making way for this second values divide between yes. liberalism with a small L and conservatism with a small C. Uh, rather than party loyalties, it's more about your cluster of values. And both sides have been activated by these big debates over Trump, over Brexit, over uh, the rise of, um, you know, new new political movements. And it, it seems to me that that is probably now here for the long term. I don't see how we put this back in the back in the bottle. Um, if anything, I think the 2020s may end up being just as volatile as the 2010s. Really? Well, that means we're going to be seeing you. I think if you if you consider that we're now in the midst of a a triple crisis that is political, economic and health. The the lesson of the Great Recession was, and that was a double crisis that was really only across economics and politics. But five years on from that crisis, you know, we saw the political downstream effects of that. I think the crisis certainly helped pave the way for some of the political uh, revolts that we saw. And, and now, as we're dealing with this pandemic, you know, we know that pandemics tend to increase inequality five years after they've hit societies. We know that the £244 billion pounds that this crisis is going to cost the UK is going to have big implications on households up and down the country. And, and those further down the ladder are going to be hit both by the health effects and the economic effects. And I think we know overall that the lingering debates over culture and identity have moved into the back seat, but they haven't left the car. You know, they could they could easily, as we've discovered in Paris and France over the last two weeks, these debates are essentially 
um, latent and they can come back to the surface quite quickly uh, as events unfold. And, you know, you can already see the sort of seeds of that. You know, we still have not resolved the high levels of migration in the UK. All we've really done is change the, the skill set. We still haven't really resolved the refugee crisis uh, in Europe. All we've done is sort of throw money at some countries and put it on the, the back burner. We haven't still solved the economic divergence between northern, more economically secure states and southern periphery states. And we still haven't got that strong and unifying political uh, leadership. Uh, and I think probably in the UK, there are people asking themselves a question still around the Conservative Party. I, I still think, even though the Conservative Party is hovering at around 40% in the, in the polls, I do think there are lots of voters asking themselves, you know, is the Conservative Party what its name implies? And I think that that question is still hanging over the Johnson leadership. You know, okay. is this guy still a Conservative? Is he really a Conservative? And I suspect that all of these debates are kind of waiting for us as we come out of COVID and we come out on the other side. And I, I suspect those are, the, are those are the debates that we'll come back to. I think, uh, in the, yes, you're quite right. In the case of Boris Johnson, you know, there was a real frustration on the statues issue or actually even on the last night of the prom thing. You know, he seemed to be very slow in coming out and saying anything compared to not just Trump, but compared to Macron, interestingly enough, who couldn't be less of a kind of populist leader. But he made it quite clear, didn't he? What, you know, if this is French history for better or worse. I think the Johnson government is fascinating for so many reasons. I mean, one is simply that we are getting different messages at different levels of the government. So, for example, I suspect many voters probably wanted Johnson to go further in the summer than he did. But on the other hand, we've seen over the last few weeks uh, the Equalities Minister speak out very forcefully against some of the uh, issues within Britain's schools and universities that obviously the government cares about. Uh, on the one hand, we haven't seen perhaps Gavin Williamson go as far as some of us might have liked on issues like academic freedom. But on the other hand, we can see that within the Conservative Manifesto and within the Department for Education, there is actually a commitment for beginning to ask some of the questions that uh, that, that some people want, want asked. So I think the jury's out. I think, you know, we're still very early into the government. You know, we, we're not even at the one year anniversary of Johnson's election uh, victory. Um, and we're already beginning to see the movement outside of the Conservative Party on the right of the Conservative Party with with these new organisations that are clearly going to try and pressure the Conservative Party on those issues. We've seen the uh, Reclaim movement, Lawrence Fox. We've seen you know Nigel Farage is still campaigning in um, you know along the south coast around the issue of uh, illegal migration. And so I think we're in this sort of COVID moment. Uh, that is, you know, for obvious reasons, attracting our attention. But as we as we come out of that, and inevitably we will we will come out of that. I think many of the debates that, in fact, Peter, you and I had in years gone by about the future direction of British politics. I think those debates will will probably continue and renew. Uh, with this coming week with the election, are, are you going to be around and about doing lots of TV and everything, and uh, you know, commentating? No, I think I'm actually just going to watch this watch this one at home. I think it's um, I think it's an election that you know we all find fascinating for many reasons. But I I think for me it's 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 quite remarkable in that on the one hand we still don't really know what um, what Biden's longer term vision for America really is, and on the other hand, nor do we really know that much about what Trump would do in a second term. He's been remarkably quiet actually about what the issue priorities would be. He's talked vaguely about further tax cuts and, you know, getting tougher on China. But we are in a in a in a very unique moment. And I think many of us in the UK are so fascinated by the US because we can probably sense that while historically we don't really do culture wars, we can probably sense that we are now on the same road as America. And we're sort of curiously watching these events perhaps with a, a greater degree of familiarity than we probably had in previous decades. Well, look, I understand you're sort of like working on a new book. I was just wondering when it's done, uh, maybe you'll come back and 
talk to us about that. It is next year, I think, isn't it, or something? You've got a, something coming up? Yeah, it should be out in September, September, October. So I make a point of uh, of us continuing the conversation because I'd, be uh, I'd enjoy that. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Matthew, for coming on, and and all the very best. And um, we will talk to you again very soon. I hope. Thank you. Uh, great. That's um, thank you. Uh, that's it for so what you're saying is this week please do remember to subscribe won't you I always say this you know like it's going out of fashion but uh, we do need your subscriptions and your support so thank you very much and see you next time bye-bye